You're listening to Journey for Truth with internationally known medium, Tai Yi practitioner, and radio host, Tammy Urbanic. Hello and welcome to Journey for Truth on iHeartRadio and YouTube. I'm Tammy Urbanic. Thank you so much for joining me. Journey for Truth Radio is always on demand and with many new episodes. If you go to journeyfortruthradio.com, you can sign up for our free newsletter and you will be notified of all new episodes that are being released. That is the only newsletter that you'll receive for those new episodes. Journeyfortruthradio.com. At my website, empowermentthroughhealing.org, you can look at the different life energy flow tie treatments that I have available. One treatment is called Aborchi. That is for women who have had abortions or miscarriages and has created kind of a emotional impact within the meridian system. And that treatment is going to help Uh, reverse that emotional impact, regardless of whether it was an abortion or a miscarriage, empowermentthroughhealing.org. Also, if you go to the JonahLifeInstitute.com website, you're going to see information there for the upcoming seminar in Denver, Colorado at the end of September, and that is titled uh, Soul Contracts and Soul Agreements. It's going to be full of fascinating information all weekend, and you can sign up online and read more about that and more about Hoska Harrison and Jonah. My guest this week is McCartney Green. McCartney has led quite a journey. Uh, After having seven children, she was financially destitute and she was sexually assaulted, which led her to attempt suicide. McCartney is going to share with us the divine intervention that she experienced and the path that it set her on after her attempted suicide. McCartney, welcome. Hi, I'm so nice to be here. It's wonderful having you. Now, you married young, and as I said, you had seven children. What led to your marriage difficulties? Well, that's a really good question. I think my husband and I were so young when we got married that we didn't really know how to handle being an adult. Mm -hmm. And we started having children right away. We were very innocent and very naive. And I think just after seven children, the stress, pretty much financial stress probably, just came between us and we began to just crumble. How young were you when you married? I was 19, but I turned 20 the very next month, so it's not as young as some people. (laughs) Yes. Well, I'm married at 18, so, you know, 18, 19, 20, that's that's 21, that's still very young, and I can certainly understand not yet having that maturity and, and that emotional maturity to handle difficulties, absolutely. Did you attempt to resolve the marriage, or was it just come to a point where, this is, isn't going to work anymore. It never dawned on me that it wasn't going to work. Um, that was that was like a light bulb that came on when during during an argument that we were having. Uh, he had said to me, "You know, you will do what I say, and if you don't like it, you can just divorce me." And wow. this light went on. <laughs> oh, and um, and I realized that I I wasn't trapped that I did, my own happiness mattered, and I did have a road that I could take. So did you become a single mother to seven children, or was it divided evenly, or? It's hard to say a single mother, because even though we finally divorced, um, we both worked very hard together. It seemed like once we divorced, we became best of friends, hmm. and and we believed in love, both of us did. Um, and once we were apart, we were able to like be together in love for the children always. And so we were pretty much always together every birthday. And with seven children, there's one every month. <laughs> and, <laughs> and every holiday and every event, whether it's a play or a sporting event. So we were pretty much together and, and we kept that love alive. And I think we just knew we couldn't handle it as husband and wife. Mm-hmm. And I've heard that before. Um, so th- and that's wonderful, wonderful for the kids and wonderful for you and your ex-husband. So what happened with the sexual assault? Oh, um, I was in a Wendy's parking lot and a man, I was, you know how the drive through tells you to pull up, pull up and wait for your food if they don't have everything ready. And I was picking up some things for my kids and I had to go pick my daughter up from middle school. So I pulled up and I was sitting in that parking lot waiting for my food. And a man approached me 
to my open window. I thought he was bringing me my food. And instead, he grabbed me and pushed me down in the seat and assaulted me. Wow. In broad daylight. Well, it was it was an evening. It was dark outside. It was, but it was only like seven thirty in the evening, and there were people around, and that was one of the things that was so stressful for me. And what I wrote about in one of my one of my books was the fact that I didn't scream, I didn't yell. I I completely froze. I just froze, and I had was filled with guilt over that because I always thought of myself as being this tough lady. And if anybody ever tried anything with me, oh, I'd just let them have it. And I, I didn't. I totally froze. And it was uh, hard to overcome the guilt of that. So between the divorce, being financially destitute, raising your children, and then you are sexually assaulted, was that the tipping point that led to your attempted suicide? I think it was. Um, I, once that happened, I really felt like just nobody cared and that I wasn't a worthy human being, you know, how your mind can play tricks with you. And uh, I felt unworthy. I felt like my children would be better off without me. My husband, we weren't divorced yet at the time, and my husband would definitely be better off without me. The world would be better off without me, and I can't take the pain anymore. And I took prescription pills and tried to kill myself. But I failed. Thank goodness. Yes, yes, thank goodness. <laughs> so you were stating that no one would care. Did you report uh, this assault? No. I didn't report it. And I think that had to do with the shame that I felt that I hadn't even fought. I don't think he had a weapon. He was a very big man, but I don't think he had a weapon. I didn't fight. I didn't scream. I didn't make a big deal about it. I just sort of shoved it aside. And I think the shame of that is one of the reasons I didn't report it. So he assaulted you and then he just walked away. And he just walked away. And I saw him again uh, three or four months later, maybe. The timeline's not quite right, but he actually walked up to me in a restaurant while... Um, the person I was with was at the counter ordering, and he walked up to me in a restaurant and put his arm around me, and and I I did it again. I froze. He said, what, you won't talk to me now? Wow. And, and then he walked out. And then I told, when the person came back, I said, that was him. That was him. And, of course, that person went, oh, where is he? I'm going after him. Like, no, no, please. You know? It's oh, funny the way goodness. we react. Yeah, it is. And well, and it's also very difficult. And um, it is a very understandable in the way that you reacted. I mean, you have someone that that close to you in your space, a lot of people freeze, you know, they that's the fight or flight, uh, except you didn't fight you you froze. And it's, you know, it's like your brain freezes up. When you decided to attempt suicide and I'm asking this question for other listeners who perhaps have someone in their life who have attempted suicide what was the process that you were going through in your head that led you to say this is it I'm, I'm going to take my own life away that's a really good question because I I've I've listened as you know certain celebrities have taken their lives and I've listened to everyone talk about um, them being a coward or they were selfish or they weren't thinking about other people. And, and in a way, that's right. It's like if you were on fire, all you can think about is putting that fire out. Right. You're not thinking about anything else. And in a way, that's how it is. You're in so much pain that you want to just stop the pain. Just stop the pain. Then I'll figure everything out. That's one side of it. But the other side is that maybe everyone will be better off if I wasn't around. And so that's how you rationalize it so that you feel like you're not hurting anyone. You're doing something for them. Mm. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. And I like the, the analogy that you used in someone being on fire and all they can think about is putting out the fire. And that's my understanding of suicide is that a, it's not necessarily that a person wants to die so much, but that they want the pain to go away. And, and they have, like you stated, rationalized and have decided that's the only way to do it, 
to make the pain go away. And in my work, I have seen that that's not the case, that the pain remains. And that is a misunderstanding that a lot of people have, that when we physically die, everything goes away. But if you have emotions, you have thoughts, you have perceptions, you have false beliefs, you take all of that with you. So you lose your physical body, but you take all of your pain, all of your trauma, and now you're added trauma from having taken your own life, and you no longer have the physical body to say, I'm going to call someone. I'm going to get an anxiety medication to kind of get me over a hump. I'm going to see a therapist. I'm going to move. You don't have those options anymore because you've taken away that option. And that's something that everyone needs to understand. But also what people need to understand for friends and loved ones who may attempt suicide, a lot of times it's not about the other people, but about wanting the pain to go away. And so compassion, much compassion is needed. Tell us about the intervention you received by the one you call the messenger. I woke up one morning. It was soon after this happened but I can't give you a real timeline, two or three weeks, maybe two months. I woke up one morning and there was a man standing at the end of my bed. And I know a normal woman would have said, screamed, oh my gosh. Yeah. But <laughs> um, but this, this man was giving off such, emanating such love, kindness, compassion, and he had light around him. And I had a knowing, just a knowing that mm -hmm. this this is not a man, man, even though he looks to be solid flesh. This is some sort of heavenly messenger, some sort of transcendent being. And he has nothing on his mind except goodness and love. And I felt very safe. He smiled at me, and it was the kindest smile I've ever seen. And we had a conversation, but I do not remember the conversation until the very end. And I think that's because it's not for me to remember yet, but I will eventually remember what was said. But he did say, write. And at that time, I'd never written anything and except a letter. And, and I was very irreverent. I said, write? Write what? And he says, write your story, write love, and begin immediately. Mm -hmm. And and so I did. I began writing my story, which, as you know, wasn't turning out so well. So I, I said, oh, I'm going to just tweak this a little bit, and I'll change the ending to make it a little more fun. And then I had to change the beginning to make it match the ending. And next thing I know, I was writing total fiction, and I was thinking, oh, I have found my bliss. This is wonderful. I love this. And I based the story that I wrote. I wrote a hero into the, the fiction story that I was writing. Um, and I based him on the man that I had seen. And I based all, I, I ended up writing an eight book series, fiction series called Dandelions Never Die. It's all about women who overcome, well, and men too, who overcome amazing traumas to become strong, joyful people, successful people. And I, there's a constant through all those books, and that is Grandmaster Eric Kino, who is, I based on the heavenly messenger who came and spoke to me. What pieces of advice did he offer you? Personally. Well, personally. Um, recently, he has given me so much because I lost touch with him for a while, and then I'm back in touch now. And the main thing is joy. Mm. He has... In the, in the book that he just led me to writing, he has told me a, a formula, like a seven-step formula that everyone can follow. And it could be the formula to supercharge your spiritual connection. It could be the formula to amazing joy. It can be the formula to enhancing your psychic abilities. It can be the formula to manifesting anything you want. It's funny. It's all the same, all those steps bring you all those things. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. That's wonderful. Now, you stated you lost touch with this individual. Why do you think that that occurred? I think it was me and my low vibration. I think we may have even contracted before I ever came to Earth that if I didn't figure things out by the time I was a certain age, 
that he would come down here and knock me upside the head. <laughs> so <Happens>. he did. <laughs> yes. And so he did. And, and then immediately I did start writing, but I also took this amazing, miraculous happening and I pushed it aside into the corner of my mind somewhere and thought, I'll just leave that there. I won't tell anyone. I, I didn't tell anyone except my family. And I almost made it look like it was, this is just inconsequential. This doesn't matter. Or I think that came from fear of people thinking that I was crazy. Mm -hmm. Since then, I found out there's lots of people who have had visitations mm -hmm. from their spirit guides and from angels and from heavenly messengers. They're all different but and all the same. Um, but I think my vibration was so low. And the reason... I finally heard back from him again was my first husband passed away back in 2013 and once that happened I became more diligent about my meditation and about doing the things I know I'm supposed to do to have a healthy spiritual physical um, emotional life I hear that um, I see that happening a lot where a person will become in resistance to intervention. There will be resistance to receiving higher guidance. I've been there. You've been there. You were just talking about, I think most people, if not everyone, has been there to certain varying degrees between person to person. But it, it is true, and what I have experienced myself, is that when there is resistance to something that needs to be happening, you know, that needs to be occurring, then it does start slowing down. It starts to dissipate, not because they or that the assistance wants to dissipate, but because that refusal is kind of building a wall and it gets harder and harder to receive information. But when that flow is there, when the procrastination is gone, then that energy can start picking up again many times. But in some cases, it goes away and you've lost an opportunity. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you reopened yourself and that energy came back into your life to begin assisting you, I would bet that the individual didn't leave, but you weren't I, receiving. And, and then once you were open yeah. to receive, he's like, oh, I'm back. You know, it can, you know, I'm being silly That's, about it. Absolutely. <laughs> That's one of his messages is that I've always been here. I've, I've been here. I'm always here and I will always be here. Sometimes you can't hear me but I'm always here. And that was one of his most recent messages. And also what you just said, that if we ignore what's being given us, then it will eventually stop happening. Right. It'll, the, it'll withdraw. I, I was walking the other day. I do a lot of, I have, I get a lot of conversations when I'm walking. I think I get into the zone, into my meditative zone when I'm walking. And I was walking the other day and I was saying, I was asking a question. I said, I just wish I could get a sign. And then I went, I said, oh, no, wait. Oh, in the Bible, it says we're not supposed to ask for a signs. And immediately the voice came into my mind. No, that's a fallacy. We send signs. There are signs everywhere. And yes. we want you to see them. And we don't want you to ignore them. Signs when you say something, maybe I should do this. And a star goes shooting across the sky. That's not a coincidence signs when maybe I should call so-and-so and then they call you. That's not a coincidence. These are signs and we need to recognize them. And as long as we do, then we'll get more and more and more. That is absolutely um, correct. 100% correct. The signs are everywhere. And when we're in tune with those signs, many times the signs can become subtle. Uh, what I have learned is that when you are in the flow of your healing, things happen in a subtle manner. You heal in a subtle manner. A completion of a healing occurs in a subtle manner. But when we're in resistance to something, it's like we get hit over the head. It's like, boom. You know, like sometimes a car accident, sometimes a major flat tire on a main highway. I mean, there are so many signs that occur. A lot of times we don't recognize it as a sign. We just, you know, I had bad luck. It was bad timing. You know, there's typically an excuse that a person can come up with. But um, I also like that you stated that he said 
He was always around. It's just that you weren't always receiving his information, which is very true for people's guides. Most people are, I would say a good portion of the population doesn't know they have guides. And there's still communication, but it's usually on an unconscious level. On a conscious level, there's that wall and there's a resistance and, you know, guides don't exist or I don't have any help out there. I'm all alone, that type of mentality. But it's still there. And from your experience, it sounds like you're educating people to be open to their assistance. And true assistance, not manipulation that pretends to be assistance, but true assistance never forces. And that tells me that the individual you were communicating with is authentic. When he just kind of stood back and waited, that is assistance. That's beautiful. It is. And what you said just now is so important. It was the never forces, never forces, never threatens something. People think, well, this is done in love, but if it's not done with love attached to individual freedom, then it's not the right thing. Right. So it has to be both love and freedom, love and freedom. If you don't have the freedom to choice, or I happen to know that there are other people, Entities who try to make contact, who have not very good things on their mind, and they always use fear um, or something ugly, something that would cause me to tremble. And I know it's so easy to discern for me now, but it wasn't at one time. Mm -hmm. But it's easy to discern now. But yes, it's you know that he's the good guy when it's love and freedom together. I must make the choice. Absolutely. And that includes when a person wants another individual to come in and fix something. Just come in and take care of this for me. I can't deal with it anymore. That is control. That is asking for someone else to control your choices and to control your outcomes. So if a person says, I hear you, I love you, you're right, I'm going to fix this for you. I, I'm, you don't have to do a thing. I'm going to take care of it. Or however they want to phrase it, but that's the energy, I would run. I would run so fast because that is control and eventually there will be even more manipulation involved there. Um, Now, how did this lead to your eventual eventual awakening? Was it continual advice that he was giving you? Was it choices that you were making? Well, I hadn't, you know, I didn't hear from him or I, I wasn't listening for, for 22 years since that time. That was 1994. Oh, goodness. That he first came to me and all the way now in 2015, when someone had written on my Facebook page and they said, are you ever going to write anything else about the Kinos, which is the last name of this enti- of this being that I wrote about in my fiction books. And I said, well, I don't know. I'll think about it. You know, I don't know why I, they're getting old. I'd have to make them live forever. And she said, well, it'd be fine with me if they live forever. So, um, and this was just a reader that I didn't know. So it was very sweet for her to write me, but I went on a walk that day. And as I was walking, I said, why should I even write anything ever again? I mean, my my books aren't really selling off the shelf, and um, a few people have read them and love them, but, you know, I wouldn't hardly call me a successful author. Why should I write at all? I don't understand. Why would some heavenly messenger even come and visit me and tell me to write if nothing was ever going to come of it? That You know, I was being my old rebellious self. I'm, I'm very, very much a rebel. And the words came to me very, very strongly. They said, write a nonfiction book. Write the memoirs of this Eric Kino. And immediately I said, but, but, but that's fiction and people will think I'm trying to pull a fast one. <laughs> and, and he said, he said, you must always be honest. And so write a preface that says that this is an allegory. And we will give all the messages that, and all the things, the wisdom that you need to go into this book, we will give it to you. And, and that's how I began writing uh, the book that, I'm, that I just finished. And uh, my mind started racing. Oh, well, this sounds kind of like fun. I could write about Eric, you know. And, and I went immediately to um, a, a fake interview in my mind as I was walking about. This interviewer would ask, and and Grandmaster Kino, do you believe in God? 
And he would answer, yes, of course. And then they would say, well, as a man of science, how could you believe in God? And he would say, well, as a man of science, how could I not? And, um, and I, I went, I went you know, through this like that. And the next thing I knew, I was at home. And my husband says, how was your walk? And I said, oh, it was really interesting. And he said, well, I sent you a video on Facebook. Why don't you go check it out? So I did. And my jaw just dropped because he sent me a video that said, Scientists prove God exists. And at the 33 second mark was the exact words that I had just done in my fake interview in my head. And this was the beginning of receiving so many nods and signs from that day forward um, as I wrote the book that let me know that this was not just a conversation you had in your head. This was real. Sit up. Take notice. Wake up. Here we go. Wonderful. And, um, Miracle after miracle has happened since then. So many, so many. What a beautiful example. Now, what are the five keys to manifesting magnet or becoming a manifesting magnet? How do you phrase it? Um, I say unshakable joy. Five keys to becoming a manifesting magnet. And as I said, these keys that he gave me are... um, they're the keys to everything, to spiritual connection, which gives you unshakable joy. And unshakable joy is what makes you become a manifesting magnet. And the keys are, um, first, living, if you can have a spiritual connection, that brings you joy, and joy brings you what you want. So you begin that spiritual connection by pulling light. That is the most important thing. Do you, I know that you know how important it is to meditate and to pull light through your body. And a lot of people don't want to meditate because it takes too long. And they certainly don't want to do a light uh, meditation, you know, because they, they just don't have the time. They feel like they don't have the time. Mm-hmm. But he showed me this pulling of light where you just see a whoosh of light just come through your body whoosh, in two seconds. You just feel it in two seconds. And this whooshing of light um, is so important to your spiritual connection because anybody could do that. We just did it, right? It took us two seconds just pulling that light through the top of our head. Some people some people embellish it. It came from God. It came from the stars. It came right. from the universe. It came from Christ, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. It's light. And where there's light, there can be no darkness. And so we pull light through our body. Just imagine if everyone in the world, or if even a small percentage, you know, 5% of everyone in the world, every day, several times a day, just pulled light through their body, and it goes into the core of the earth. The earth would just be pumped up with all this beautiful light, and we could change the world. I know we can. But that's just one of the keys. The other key is living in gratitude, because If you have a low vibration, and everyone needs to have a high vibration to feel joy, but let's say you're having a bad day, all you have to do is think about anything that you're grateful for. Very important. Anything. Anything. Because the attitude of vibration, the vibration of gratitude is one of the highest vibrations that you can have. And when you're thinking of something or someone, let's say, that you're truly grateful for, do you feel anything other than gratitude? No. All of a sudden, fear's gone, anger's gone, everything's gone because all you feel is gratitude. Exactly. So that's that's one of the uh, really main keys. So, awesome. Those are two uh, Those excellent are two. keys. What are the yes. other three? Okay, um, there is um, letting go. Mm. We all hold on to life with with an iron fist, trying to control the outcome of everything that we do. And that doesn't mean that I want everybody to just stop trying. Of course, we give our best, we give our all to whatever our endeavors are. But then we have to let go of the outcome. Just let go and let it be. And it's it's that resistance of trying to push it, Mm -hmm. trying to make it happen that keeps things from happening. As if we can learn to just let go of everything. you know, I when my kids were playing football, oh, I wanted them, oh, please, just make this pass, just make this pass, just catch it, you know, and I can't, I couldn't make it, and we can't make things happen the way we want them to, and if we think we can, or if we try, we're never going to be happy, 
mm-hmm. <laughs> because we're always going to say, I didn't, it didn't happen. And we can't have anything depend on outside circumstances. So we have to let go. Otherwise, we're, in, we're at the whim of whatever life brings our way. Well, that is very true. And our conscious choices are not always in line with our soul choices. Right. So when we have a conscious desire to do something, to achieve something, to have a certain outcome, that can be great. But if that's not in alignment with our soul, then there's going to be difficulty. There's going to be sometimes walls that we hit against, obstacles, roadblocks, and then we just we feel frustrated, we feel like we're doing something wrong. And sometimes it is a, that a person is making poor choices. However, there are situations where you need to be in alignment with the soul's timing and what your own soul has chosen for you to manifest, to create, whether it's a relationship, I see that a lot, where people, I just, I need a relationship, I need a relationship. Right. And, and a lot of time, well, actually there's resistance there to having a relationship, and here are the reasons why there's resistance. And then I hear from the person, yeah, well, that's true and everything. But they, get, they keep hitting against that wall. So I agree, there are many times that we just need to make the wise choices, do the work, not go through the motions, but do the work, and then just allow the outcome to manifest in its appropriate timing. And what is the final one? Oh, let me see. I've lost track. Gratitude, letting go, pulling light. Do you remember what else I said? I think we actually have two more real quick. (laughs) Okay. Um, They are... uh, well, my mind went blank. Um, well, spiritual spiritual alignment was one of the ones. Raising our vibration so that we're absolutely aligned spiritually. Oh, I just remembered. Um, meditation and prayer, um, which are two different things to me. Um, the prayer is not necessarily a begging of please let this happen please do this for me or that for me. It's more of, to me, I just like to give gratitude and possibly state my intentions and ask for guidance. Mm, wonderful. And then the med- if, if If you don't quiet your mind and meditate and quiet your mind, then people say, God never listens to me. He doesn't answer my prayers. But do you ever take the time to just meditate and slow your mind down? And, and that's when all the wisdom and all the the knowledge and the things come rushing in once we stop and just listen. And stopping and listening is such a peaceful feeling. So prayer and meditation were those were those last two that are so important. Wonderful. Pulling light. <laughs> all of that is excellent information. And where can they find your information and your books? Um, my website uh, will have everything on there, um, and that's McCartneyGreen.com. Um, and my book is on Amazon, Nook, Kobo, iTunes, all of those e-books plus in paperback um, at in- Barnes & Noble and Amazon. In case anyone missed it, what was the name of your fictional series? The fictional series is Dandelions Never Die. And then your nonfiction. That would be me. The nonfiction is Messages from Transcendent Beings. We are not alone. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, McCartney, for being a guest on my show this week. I really, really enjoyed it, Tammy. It's been so wonderful talking to you. And thank you, listeners, for joining me here as well on Journey for Truth on iHeartRadio and YouTube. Until next time, have a fantastic week. <laughs> 